All right. Well, shall we jump in? So word and spirit, right? Word and spirit. Word and spirit. So let's jump in. Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to wrap up our series this morning on spiritual gifts that we've been in. Um, and as I mentioned in the email, this seems like a great one to end on because of what it seems to point us towards. So 1 Peter chapter 4, and um, I'm going to go ahead and just jump us in here. Here's where we're going this morning. As we've looked at all these different passages, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, we took several weeks ago through that. Then we looked at Ephesians 4. And then we looked at Romans 12, and now we're finishing up with 1 Peter 4. Um, what, what we've seen is there's differing reasons why the Lord gives spiritual gifts. But all of those reasons get summed up in these verses this morning. And so if you're looking at 1 Peter, we're in chapter 4. Here's where we're going this morning. We steward, that's a fancy word. It means managing resources. But when we talk about it in a biblical sense, we mean managing God's resources, God's way for God's glory. So when we talk about stewarding, oftentimes we just think about money, but it's not just about money. It's managing God's resources, God's way for God's glory. Okay, and so when I say we steward, we are managing God's resources, spiritual gifts, as God intends them to be used, so God's way for God's glory. So we steward spiritual gifts to serve one another, bringing God glory. To serve one another, bringing God glory. So let's take a look. First Peter chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 7. Peter says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. I'm going to stop there just for the moment. So Peter's wrapping up his letter. He's wrapping up his letter, and he's starting to bring home some of his points and bring them back together. And so having said several things to his, his readers who, are being, uh, who, who have been spread apart, they're all spread out in different areas. So he's writing to people outside of Jerusalem. They're spread out in the, the region that we would call today the, the area of Turkey and Europe, just north of the Mediterranean Sea. And so he's trying to teach them to stay faithful in those areas that you live in, despite persecution, despite pressure, continue to press forward in living and faithful obedience. So now he's wrapping this up and he says, the end of all things is at hand. Now this is a, a common phrase we see throughout the New Testament. When, and we've talked about this briefly before. When you see the end of all things is at hand or the last days or the, the, um, the times of the end, I want you to put out of your mind, I want you to put out of your mind a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation on earth followed by a return of Christ, followed by a thousand-year kingdom. That's not what this phrase means. This phrase is not about those kind of things. This phrase is about these kind of things. Take a look. You go to Acts chapter 2 where Peter got up and he gave a sermon. And in the midst of that sermon, after the Spirit had been poured out on, on the people present, he says, this is what was said in the book of Joel. He quotes from Joel chapter 2. And here's some of that quote. And in the last day, so Joel said, and he's in the Old Testament. In the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So Peter takes Joel's words and says what's taking place today on that day of Pentecost that we see in Acts chapter 2 as the spirit was being poured out. He's saying that's what Joel was talking about, that in the last days. So by implication, Peter is making the, the assumption we are in the last days, what the Old Testament would often call the last days. Okay? We go on. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 10. In verse 11, he says, Now these things happened. So he had just finished talking about the, the path that the people of Israel had taken in the Old Testament where they had been led through the sea and then they had been given bread from heaven, the manna, and how they had drank water from the rock, and yet they remained disobedient. And so he's encouraging his readers, don't continue in disobedience. And then he says, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. 
No temptation is overtaking you, but is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So Paul's assumption is the people that he's writing to and including himself, the last days have come upon, the end of the ages has come upon them. Okay, and that was some almost 2,000 years ago. Okay? We see Paul in another place talking to Timothy. He says, now to Timothy, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some of yours says in the later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And then Paul's going to go on to give Timothy two names of men that they both knew who departed. So Paul's implication is, what's taking place, Timothy, in your day is what was said would take place in the later times, the latter days. Okay, so, so he sees and understands that, that they are in this period of time that the Scripture has referred to as the last days, the later days, the end of the ages. 2 Timothy 3.1, Paul, again to Timothy. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving God, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. And again, Paul's saying these are the kind of things that it was said was going to take place in the latter days, in the last days, and so Timothy is already seeing these kind of things. Now, you and I read something like that and we go, yep, Right? But my point to you is this, we, if, if we get overly fascinated with end times, oftentimes we call it eschatology, then we'll read things into these kind of verses that aren't intended to be there. There's no timeline intended here. Paul is simply saying, you're in these days. When the Spirit was poured out, so with the coming of Jesus in the flesh, his death, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of the Father, which then led to the pouring out of the Spirit, that's when we've entered into these last days, okay? Now, we are still in these last days, I think, okay? And, and so we are in these last days, and there's, there's not a, a timeline that we're aware of, and I know some of you would disagree with me. There's not a timeline that, I, that we're aware of that says we've only got this much time left. We've only got this time, and that wasn't Paul's point. Paul's point was not look to the news, look to the skies, and wait and watch. Paul did not intend to drop these, this, this news that you're in the last days so that Christians would stop interacting with the world. He didn't drop it so that Christians would hide and then just start watching for the times. He dropped it because he intended it to be a motivation for them to continue to live in faithful obedience and to be careful with how they live their life. How very different that is than some who get consumed with end times things and they retract themselves from the world, stop caring about the world, and they just say, I'm just going to prepare myself for that day. What if that day is still another thousand, two thousand years away? A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. In the book of Jubilees, not in the Bible, but in the book of Jubilees, it, it describes things through groups of thousands of years, right? So it takes these thousand years, and it, and it really, it breaks even smaller because it goes by jubilees, which would be like 50s and 49, seven sets of seven, so 49 years, and then the 50th is a jubilee. But in that book, one of the things it talks about is, and it just picks up on the understanding that we see in the scripture, it was common to refer to a thousand years as a day. So when you see Peter use that phrase, which is in, in, in another part of the book, of the letter, um, he's picking up on something that is, is common. A thousand years is like a day. What Jubilees tells us, by the way, just to correlate this, not a book of the Bible, okay, just being clear, but history and tradition maybe and people that wrote the Bible would have been familiar with it. Adam and Eve, Jubilees tells us, Adam and Eve, what were they told? The day, the day you shall eat of this fruit from the tree, you shall surely die. The day... You eat of the fruit of the tree, you shall surely die. What do we think when we hear day? 24 hours. And so we go, well, they didn't die. And then we go, oh, okay, well, they died spiritually. True. But what Jubilees tells us is they lived, I, want, I can't get you the exact number, but it was 900-something years Adam and Eve uh, lived, and they died before that day in which they ate the fruit had come to an end. 
that thousand year period. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years as a day. Okay, so when you and I think about time, we think in 24 hour days. And so then we've been conditioned to think that, hey, we're in the last days, it could be any day. Yeah, it, it could be. But what if any day could be a thousand years from now? What if we, this is not an original thought to me, what if we are in the early church still? We tend to think like we're part of the last days of the church. What if we are in the early days of the church still? What if your great, great, great grandchildren are still going to be around and now we are entrusted now with how we steward the things that God gives us that will then be left to those that are going to follow us two and three generations from now, four generations from now. Don't let yourself get limited in your thinking. So Paul says, uh, Peter says, in the last days. Um, here's one more in 1 John chapter 2. Children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that all are not of us. All right, so end of all things. So that then leads to Peter saying, because it is the last days, because we are in the end of all things, this is then how you should live. And so he says, be self-controlled, sober-minded, for the sake of your prayers. Self-control, I think that's obvious, but if you were just look at the, the beginning of chapter four, he's talked about, don't live like the, the, the Gentiles once lived, like when you once were living that way, when you're giving yourself over to all your, your pleasures and you're giving yourself over to all the desires of your heart and you're chasing after all of those things. He says, don't do that. Don't give yourself over to that. Be self-controlled. Be sober-minded so that you can think clearly, so that you can see things clearly. If you're consumed with these things that are, that are um, dishonoring to the Lord, these things that are chasing after your own pleasures, your own things, then if you see those things and you're consumed with those things, it keeps your mind clouded. You're not able to think clearly and see clearly. So he says, be sober-minded. The imagery is clear. When you're under the substance, a substance, your mind gets foggy. You turn your head real slow, but it feels like you just jerked your head and things are still trying to catch up, right? You, you, you can't think real sharply. You, you realize there are thoughts that are out there and I can't quite grasp it, right? You, you, you're not clear-headed. Now you're wondering why I can describe that so clearly. But he says, for the sake of your prayers, so being self-controlled and being sober-minded, he says, affects your prayers. This is the third time in this letter he has talked about prayers. So take a look at this. 1 Peter chapter 3. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the, women, to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Don't get lost on that last part. Focus in on this part, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, the way we treat our wives impacts whether our prayers will be heard. I remember a professor when my, the week I was getting married, I was at the Bible college, I worked there and he found out I was getting married. He, he took me right to this verse and he said, treat your wife well if you want your prayers to be heard. And I never heard that before. It's here, but I'd never heard that. No, I'd ever thought about that. But, but Peter links the way husbands treat their wives as to whether or not their prayers will be hindered or not. There's one place he talks about prayer. Then later on in that chapter, he'll say in, in chapter 3, verse 9, do not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this to you was, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. And then he quotes from Psalm 34, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil. So again, don't speak evil, don't, don't revile, and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The way you live your life impacts whether your prayers are heard. And what Peter is drawing on from Psalm 34 is it's the righteous whose prayers are heard. But if you are speaking evil, if you are trying to get revenge and you're acting out on revenge, these are some of the things that Peter's getting, getting uh, specific about and Psalm 34 talks about. But if you are pursuing unrighteousness, 
then it says at the very end, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. But if you are pursuing righteousness, then your prayers will not be hindered. So Peter makes that connection. And then, of course, the one we just looked at in verse, chapter 4, verse 7, being self-controlled and sober-minded. Peter's concerned about the believers being able to pray in ways where their prayer is heard and that prayer is effective. And he's cautioning them against things that will potentially hinder their prayers. Why? Because it's of utmost importance that believers are remaining in a place where they're able to intercede for one another, where they're able to to pray as the Lord is leading them to pray about the things that he wants them to pray about so that they can be engaged in what the Lord is doing. But if our prayers are hindered, then we, uh, we have access to power that is being cut off, power that is freely given to us in Christ, not being accessible because our prayers are being hindered. Okay? So he says, be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Every other ver- set of verses that we've looked at for spiritual gifts connects spiritual gifts with the pursuit of love. 1 Corinthians 12, spiritual gifts. But then he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians 13, the more excellent way is love. Here's what love looks like. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, so pursue love and earnestly desire the gifts, especially that you might prophesy. Ephesians 4 talked about um, pursuing love. As they, as, they, as they went past the verses that we looked at, it talked about speaking the truth in love. Romans 12, if you were to keep reading past where we stopped, I want to say maybe around verse 8 or 9, it picks it up and it talks about love your neighbor as yourself. Everywhere the gifts are talked about, it connects it with love. Character matters when it comes to pursuing spiritual gifts. Character matters. And we are called first and foremost to pursue love above everything else. And the the pursuit and the desire of spiritual gifts apart from love is not what God intends but it is oftentimes what we see and what we experience. And this is why we get turned off. This is why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 13, you might be able to speak in the tongues of angels and of men. You might receive all knowledge and prophecy, and yet you have not love, and so you just sound like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, or you're gaining nothing. We cannot detach love from the spiritual gifts. And so Peter does the same thing. He says, love covers a multitude of sins which is really a quote of Proverbs 10, verse 12, which says this, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So what Peter is getting at specifically, because what Proverbs is getting at is you and I laying down our right to be offended. Uh Oh, yeah. (laughs) Laying down our right to be offended. What does that mean? Particularly when it comes to other believers is this context, It would be easy for me to take up offense because you said something wrong or you didn't say it the right way or you know what, you spoke out of turn or you did something, whatever, and now I'm going to be offended. And what do I do when I'm offended? I distance myself from you. I act out of that offense with that barrier there, which means I'm not acting sincerely when I relate to you. And maybe what happens is Maybe I'm not normally sarcastic, but all of a sudden I'm sarcastic because what that sarcasm is, in in this case, would be a defensive mechanism to keep you at a distance. Right? We act out in an offense. We act in ways that instead is from hatred, and it stirs up strife. But Peter says, hey, we want to earnestly pursue loving one another, which means I cover up offenses. When I choose to love someone, it means I, I'm not excusing what's done, but I'm choosing not to act out of an offense. I may be hurt. There may even be some righteous anger involved in there, but I'm choosing not to act out of that offense, which means that I have work to do. I might have to constantly, Lord, help me to forgive. Again, Lord, help me to forgive. Again, help me to forgive again. Father, I'm angry now. Would you, would you help me with that anger? We're constantly engaging and battling so that we're not letting that offense turn into bitterness and roots of bitterness. And so Peter says, hey, you, you want to, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. You want to see the body of Christ divided? Act down an offense. If you act in an offense, you will pursue division. 
because hatred is what drives that, not love. But love says, I may be hurt, but I'm going to choose to overlook that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not excusing it. If wrong is done, wrong needs to be dealt with. But I'm, I'm choosing not to act and uphold my offense. I'm laying that down. And then he says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. In the Eastern culture, hospitality would have been a much bigger thing than it is today, but we're still not excused from it. For them, hospitality would be, I'm traveling through. There's no hotels. I need a place to stay. Guess what? It's not a, when you read about inns in the scripture, there was no room in the inn. It's not likely a lodging place like you and I think about, but more a person who has extra guest rooms or family members who lived in that town who might have a place for you to stay. It's not like that, that, that Holiday Inn was all booked up. It's that someone didn't have a guest room available. But if you did, then you, you were expected, it doesn't matter what hour of the night it was, you were expected to offer hospitality. And you see this throughout the scriptures. Think about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and um, the, the angels going to Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot offered them hospitality in that area. Uh, you think about the angels that visited Abraham. He offered them hospitality, a meal and some drink. Right? Hospitality looks different in, in our culture, yes, but the idea is extending help, aid, comfort to people as they are traveling or as they're passing through or as they find themselves in need. What does that look like? So he says, and continue to do that. All right. But then he says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. As each has received a gift, Peter seems to have the assumption that each person would have a gift. This is one of the places where we'd go, we'd say, hey, if you're a believer in Christ, you have the Spirit, you've got at least a gift. At least a gift. Because as each has received one, use it, Peter would say. But specifically use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Use your gifts to serve one another. We've seen that consistently. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, the gifts were given for the common good. 1 Corinthians 14, the gifts were given so that the church might be built up. Uh, Ephesians 4, these gifts were given for the equipping of the saints to do the works of ministry so that the church might be made mature, right? These gifts are given so that they would be used for the benefit of others, not simply to build myself not simply to bring glory to me, but for the sake of serving one another. So if I've been given gifts to serve someone, what it looks like to be a good steward of that, managing God's resources, God's way, for God's glory, is now I have a responsibility. The gift or gifts that I'm given are my responsibility to use as God has intended them to use. If I don't use what God has given me uh, in the intended purpose, one, I may not be able to operate in those gifts later on. He might, he might pull them and give them to someone else. I don't have biblical support for that. I'm just talking what ifs, right? Um, or I might end up using these things that God has given me intended to serve others within the body to bring him glory, and I might end up using them in ways that take glory from God. I might fail to use them, and the body of Christ is not built up. And so we're not able to function and operate in the fullness that God wants and intends for us to operate because somebody's not bringing to bear the responsibility of utilizing their gifts. Okay? So he says, use them to serve one another. What does that look like? He gives us two categories, broadly speaking. If your gift includes speaking, Peter seems to communicate two broad categories of gifts here. He's the only one that does this. He seems to communicate speaking gifts, so you might think teaching, prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, right, where you're communicating, and then he, communicate, he seems to uh, talk about serving gifts, and that would be all those other ones that don't include, include talking, right? So if you have a speaking gift, as one who speaks oracles of God, or as one who speaks the words of God, I hear them, I hear them. Um, and so the idea is if you have a speaking gift, and Perhaps he specifically maybe has in mind prophecy at this point because other places where we see this word translated oracles, it talks about God revealing things to Moses or revealing things to other people. The idea is if you have a gift, you use it to speak as you're speaking the words of God. That carries a weight to it. I'm not speaking my own words. If I've got a speaking gift, a word of prophecy, a teaching gift, a word of knowledge, wisdom, whatever, I speak it as speaking the words of God. 
And if I have a serving gift, and I do so in the strength that God gives, I don't operate apart from the power and the intention of God in the gifts that he gives. I use them to serve others in the way that God intends. So that in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. When I use the gifts that God gives, and I manage them in a way that God intends me to manage them, and to use them for the purpose that God intends me to use them, to serve others, I bring God glory. And everything that you and I are about, we were created to bring God glory. There is nothing higher, there is no higher pursuit than to do that which brings God glory. And if I do something, or I use something that God has entrusted to me to take away from his glory, I'm in dangerous water. So instead, I want to steward the spiritual gifts to serve one another, which means I've got to be involved in people's lives and people's got to be involved in my lives. We've got to, we've got to in, engage in our, our lives together with one another. I'm going to steward God's gift, serving others, and in doing so, I'll bring glory to God. All right. Let's bring those kiddos in here. If they're out there, come on in, you guys.